Thank you very much. And formally, good evening to everyone and welcome. Um, it is so nice to be welcoming alumni and friends of the University of London for the first time in three years at an in-person event. We've had a couple of days of graduations today. We've got another one tomorrow. Um, but for me, particularly as the Director of Development and Alumni Relations at the University of London, it's wonderful to see so many of you together in the room. Um, we're delighted to be back here. Um, we've missed you very much. Um, and that's not try. I generally mean that. Um, I'll shortly be handing over to the Vice Chancellor, who will hopefully be not quite as croaky as me. Um, but there are some housekeeping points. Apart from a reminder, if you have a dietary card, please put it on your table, otherwise you won't get the food you expect. Um, and I know there's a lot of COVID safe guidelines that um, people have been asking about when you can, when you can't wear your mask. Are they coming up on the screen? Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, so you're not allowed to intermingle when dinner is served. Because obviously if you're eating and drinking, your mask can be down, so that's fine. So please sit and stay at your tables. Um, food and beverages must be consumed at your table. Masks must be kept on throughout the event, unless you're having dinner or unless you're one of the speakers. Um, only fully vaccinated guests are allowed to participate in the event, um, and we encourage you to uh, sanitise your hands regularly, please. If you're feeling unwell, or in the day or two after the event, please, if you could let myself or Holly Peterson or any of the uh, university staff know, um, that would be very helpful, or colleagues at the Audiovisual Console. Is there another slide? Oh, the Slido. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just run through how uh, the timings for tonight will work. Um, so once I've handed over to Wendy, we'll kick off for a panel discussion which will run for about um, 30 minutes um, between uh, the Vice Chancellor Wendy Thompson, Stephen CO, and Alex Chan. Um, and then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. But during the uh, evening, you should actually have the opportunity to submit questions via Slido. And you should be able to see the Slido QR code, um, which is uh, and the uh, code number, which is UOL April 2022. There we go, on the screen. Thank you very much. Um, when we come to the q and I'll share questions. I'll do my best. We only have 20 minutes. I'll do my best to curate them and put them to the Vice Chancellor, who can put them to the panel. You can vote for questions, um, so you can see which ones are the most popular. <coughs> Excuse me. And then <coughs> we should have dinner after that. Uh, we're running slightly behind schedule, probably because of the rain. So uh, dinner will be served maybe 7.30, 7.45. Um, and again, please, we'd appreciate your help in complying with the COVID safe rules this evening by staying seated during the dinner service. Once we've had dinner, um, so we've got three courses, be about an hour and about, so about 8.30, 8.45, we will hear. Um, I'll be back on stage um, and I'll introduce you to the president of the Singapore alumni group, Joel Teo. Um, and after Joel's said a few words and encourage you to get more involved with the alumni group, and thank you very much to the group. We couldn't do any of this without you. Um, a keynote address from Sam Myers, Her, Maj Her Majesty's Deputy Trade Commissioner for the Asia Pacific in the Department for International Trade. So Sam, uh, he's got his glass of wine lined up and he's, uh, he's all ready to go. So um, hopefully the, the panel discussion will be of interest and will help your keynote address. Uh, and then we will wrap up. Um, Wendy will uh, say thank you very much. And we probably wrap up around nine o'clock or just after. Um, but um, again, I can't reiterate how pleasant it is to have people together in person for this event. And it's my honor to introduce you to Professor Wendy Thompson, CBE, the Vice Chancellor of the University of London. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I do apologize. I got my notes in the wrong order. I'm going to give you a quick introduction about who Wendy is, and then you can applaud. I can give her two rounds of applause. Um, Sorry, Wendy. So, Professor Thompson has been leading the university since July 2019, and she's only the second female vice chancellor in the university's history. And she's seen us through one of the most challenging times in that history. We've launched in that time the university's new strategy, transforming education, creating futures. She was awarded a CBE for her work on public service reform in the 2005 New Year's Honours Lists. And Wendy holds a PhD in social administration from the University of Bristol, and a tenured professorship in social policy at McGill University in Montreal, where she was also the director of the School of Social Work and a founding member of the Centre for Research on Children and Families. Wendy has had a distinguished career in public service and social policy. She established the Office of Public Service Reform under Tony Blair. <coughs> she advised governments in Nigeria and Ghana, as well as the UNDP and OECD missions in the Middle East. 
She was appointed to lead commissions on child welfare and healthcare financing in Canada, and she served as the Chief Executive of Newham Council in London, <coughs> excuse me, and recently as the Managing Director of Norfolk County Council before she joined the University of London. She is currently a member of the Board of Universities UK, London Higher and Diabetes UK, and the Chair of the Social Market Foundation. This week, as Vice-Chancellor, she's been presiding over graduation ceremonies for some of our newest graduates from the Singapore Institute of Management. And alongside tonight's event, these represent our first in-person events here in Singapore for three years. Finally, Wendy, thank you very much for chairing tonight, and I'd invite you to come onto the stage and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. See, the older you get, the longer that takes. <laughs> uh, you real, uh, but I guess I've been busy. Anyway, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Bill. And uh, allow me to welcome all of you, our alumni and distinguished guests. Uh, we are really delighted to be hosting our first event in Singapore since the start of the pandemic, as, as Bill has said. Um, I was really disappointed to not be able to join you as we would have normally in April 2020, and again, we would have normally been here in April 2021. You know, when I got this job, it, was, um, it had many attractions, and I still feel hugely privileged to be doing it. But, but one of the things that was slightly wrongly advertised, that it was meant to involve a great deal of travel <laughs> and meeting interesting people. Now, I'm still meeting interesting people, but the travel side of the, uh, of the proposition has not been quite as busy in the last uh, couple of years. I hope now we can look forward to something different. Um, so I, the university, as, as many of you will know, is actually a, a federation of 17 of the most distinguished research and specialist higher education institutions in London. It's founded in 1836 by royal charter from King William IV. So as you can imagine, we are rather steeped in history and innovation. We received our second royal charter from Queen Victoria in 1858, and the university since then has offered degrees to students all over the world. So although some people felt the pandemic you know, introduced a whole new era of online and distance education, to be fair, we've been at this rather a long time, um, although it changes, obviously, as the years go by. So today, we have more than 50,000 students in 190 countries. On more than studying on more than 100 programs from supply chain management, computer science, international relations, professional accountancy, a whole range of programs that really cover the full academic remit. And as you may know, the partnership between the University of London and Singapore is very important to us. We have more than 60,000 alumni in Singapore, which means that more than one in every 100 people in Singapore holds a degree from the University of London. Uh, so you and your fellow alumni have a significant influence on life and business in Singapore. Those of you who do social science polling, as I've done in, in my past, think, wow, that's a pretty influential group if they voted as a block, but they're unlikely to do so. But nevertheless, an important group. So right at the moment, we currently have about 8,000 students here in Singapore. And this week, as Bill has said, I'm attending graduation ceremonies for our students who've been studying with the Singapore Institute of Management. I'm very pleased to have them join us here this evening. And I was delighted that the British High Commissioner, Cara Owen, herself an alumni of the University of London, having graduated from the LSE, uh, was able to join us for the first event. So our partnership with Singapore has endured and continues to strengthen despite the challenges we have faced through the pandemic over the past few years. And really, we've had to, like so many other sectors, have seen the importance of flexibility in how we learn and how we continue to provide guidance and best practice to our member institutions in London and to our partners around the world. We're proud of our ability to continue to ensure access to education, particularly in uncertain times. Uh, I, as, as Bill has said, I've only uh, joined the university for about uh, three years, and at the beginning of that period, more or less, we began a development of a, of a new strategy, as new leaders are prone to do, uh, and ours is called Transforming Education, Creating Futures. This ambitious strategy addresses new challenges by harnessing the strengths of our history 
but at the same time forging a path for world-class university and a modern, global, and really very much digital community. Uh, some of the points that I'm sure will come up this evening uh, about the compatibility, really, of, of digital approaches to disseminating knowledge, sharing our special collections, which we hold at the Senate Library, finding new ways of sharing research and teaching uh, across the world. This approach is very much uh, uh, at the heart of, of our next strategy. Um, it shows really that partnerships and collaboration are the, are the modes of discovery for the next period and I think for the foreseeable future. Very big focus on employability uh, and the importance of education contributing to employability and really modernizing our systems to embrace and advance a green uh, future. It's support from our alumni and friends which will help make all this possible. And we've greatly appreciated the generosity of our alumni in supporting our mission. Over the past year, we've been able to provide financial support to hundreds of students, especially those who've been affected by the economic uncertainty caused by the pandemic. Most recently, we launched an urgent appeal to help students at risk caused by wider global issues. And we do have students, who came, about 90 students studying in Ukraine, uh, and obviously students from around the world who the, you know, the disruption and turbulence not only of the, of, of the pandemic, but more recently of the war in Europe has caused uh, really difficulties for them continuing. So responding to the world's challenges involves a complex mix, really, of technical and human understandings. Society requires critical in intelligence that questions the status quo and respects and nurtures inquiry. And that's very much the approach to education that we believe in and that we've uh, advanced over many years. So it's, it's this in mind that we suggested the topic for discussion of this evening to be the UK and Singapore creating a sustainable future. As the world adjusts to a new post-COVID world, there is emerging a renewed focus on sustainability as a key component of successful growth. This society was reinforced at the uh, COP26 summit in Glasgow in November 2021, and it's you know a recent announcement made this week from from the UN uh, from its uh, flagship report, sh demonstrating again the the concern that the world is on a, a fast track to overheating if we're not uh, doing something very very dramatically different. And coming here to uh, an island nation, as is England, an island nation, it's vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, you know, such as sea level uh, rising, rising temperatures, more pronounced dry seasons, as well as I think if we looked out the door, more intense rainfall. So I think we'll hear of some of the key initiatives that perhaps are already in train uh, here in Singapore, but also ones that perhaps people in the room might suggest would be a good idea to explore or adopt for the future. So I'm therefore delighted to have uh, three such esteemed and thoughtful speakers to join us uh, for this evening's event. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them to uh, joining me for the panel, as I say, are two uh, of our own UOL alumni. First, we have Alex Chan, who has over 20 years of experience in, the innovation, in innovation and technology and has won international awards for his past work. In recent years, Alex launched one of the world's most advanced video search engines and achieved four world's firsts in the process. His company, Bababox, was named one of the top companies in Singapore for the future of enterprise AI. He is a pioneer in the field of video big data and is regarded as a knowledge leader in this rapidly growing field. And in his spare time, he co-authored an Amazon book series, involves himself in alumni activities, and is currently assisting other Singaporean companies entering the UK market. Maybe I could ask Alex Chan to, to join us here while I go on to introduce Stephen. Give him a moment to think about what he might like to say. Thanks, thanks Alex. Stephen Seo also is the founder and executive director of Singapore Consultancy. He has 20 years of working experience in banking and consulting. Previously, he was the Asia Head of Wealth Management for Mercer during 2013-2017. And prior to joining Mercer, he was EY Advisory for five years. 
Over the course of his career, he has also worked in City Private Bank, IBM, PwC Consulting, and Odyssey. And across his career, Stephen works with banks, insurance companies, independent financial advisors, and family offices. Stephen also actively volunteers for nonprofit organizations. He's passionate about solving problems related to manpower, healthcare, intergenerational poverty, and children. And he currently serves in four charities, largely on boards and company memberships. So these, uh, I'll ask Stephen perhaps to join us. Some uh, on where we are. I've lost track of him. Here he is, just to take a seat. Have a seat. Uh, uh, we're extremely grateful also, as, as Bill has said, to be joined by Sam Myers, His Maj Her Majesty's Deputy Trade Commissioner for Asia Pacific, who will be giving the keynote address after dinner. So I want to ensure we have time to talk through the issues of the day with our panelists. So I'm going to invite them each in turn to say a few words, uh, and I will join uh, in on the, on the conversation. So perhaps Alex would like to kick off with a few words and then Steve. I think, I think it's must off. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the university for putting me up on the panel, right? Um, I, I always say that uh, we have the war going on, the nuclear war, and and the weapons are very powerful, but one of those things that are most powerful right, is called the arrow, <laughs> right? So uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Um, it's, it's, tru it's truly an honor, right? Um, I, I think one of those things that... Um, with the topic for sustainability. I mean, it's, it's crucial looking at the world today, right? And, and we have so many things that are happening around the world. I was trying to connect, okay, sustainability and, and with the university as well, and, and the reason why we are here, right? And with, with so many things that are going on, the polarization you have, um, you, you have um, so, so many uh, crises that's happening, right? So I think it's not just sustainability, but I think the word, I will add the word self in front of the word sustainability, self-sustainability, right? So this gives a, a, a more urgent, um, how do you say, a, a more urgent sense where we are in a, a more of a crisis mode, right? Because it's not just sustainable, but how, do we, uh, how are we able to uh, sustain ourselves, right? But we all know that we can't do this alone. We cannot do this alone. So we need friends, not just friends, right? But real friends, not not more of a not an enemy of an enemy become a friend. That kind of friend, but a, how do you identify real friends, right? And this is where I believe, uh, coming back to the topic of UK and Singapore, this is where the opportunity is, where we can be real friends, right? And for many reasons, right? Um, first of all, we we drive on the left hand side, <laughs> right? <laughs> we we speak English. Uh, many of our systems. Uh, uh, belongs to the Commonwealth, right? And and we are we also have many shared history, particularly for Singapore, with over two hundred years, right? And we have many shared problems as well, common problems, right? Uh, problems with aging, sustainability, energy. So these are common things, common themes that we have in common. So of course, you which will come back to the relationship of. Um, how do we maintain the relationship between UK and Singapore at the government level, right? We, I mean, that the, we actually signed the digital economy agreement recently. So that's, I think, is very important because in terms of data exchange, we only give data to real friends, to people you can trust. So that at the data level, at the government level, right, we have actually established that, and it, which is a very important milestone, right? That is at the macro level. But what can we do at a micro level? Meaning that, and this is, I believe, where the university has a place. Uh, the alumni, the network has a place because we're looking at working at a micro level. The, the very reason why we are here today talking about this topic, right, simply because we're connected by the three letters UOL. Right? And, that is, and this is where I believe where the opportunity is and how we can work uh, together right, for sustainability. Right? And how are we able to do this uh, as, uh, in terms of friendship, interpersonal relationship, right, at a micro level? Right? If you, so the way I see this is, this is actually a very good opportunity tonight for us to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. S Stephen, would you like to just say a few words to warm up the conversation 
on around sustainability and, and your own area of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Stephen. Uh, I'd like to share some thoughts on sustainability. And I will start off from a charity perspective. The, the first thing to talk about sustainability is to talk about the common denominators between UK and Singapore. And one way to start off is to talk about what we are passionate about. What do we care about? Because ultimately, sustainability, it's about survivability. And it's also about survivability for a cause. So there are three things that I'd like to share with you very briefly in the opening remarks. One is around health, issues around health. Second, about education. And the third one is about relationship. So let me start off with health. Uh, I serve in the Diabetes Singapore charities, and that's a common interest between Vice Chancellor and I. And I think you are very passionate about type 1, type 2 diabetes, as I do. Um, so that is a common cause that bind UK and Singapore as a start. Now, talking about diabetes, what is the linkage to sustainability? In health particularly, diabetes is something that affects people that is uh, in, in high income status, people that is of low income status. When we talk about sustainability and when we talk about health, and when we link it to diabetes as an example, how, how can we deal with that? Uh, we, we know of people who, who have started like low GI rise that focus on lower water consumptions. And uh, that's one way we can achieve sustainability by promoting uh, better food choices. Another area that concerns us is the issues uh, faced by the lower income segments of the various countries, like even in a country like Singapore. Studies have shown in Singapore that many of the diabetes patients that comes from the lower socioeconomic um, uh, index are the ones that make very poor food choices. So how can we deal with that? Now, if we can help them to make better food choices, that also helps us to create a better sustainable future. Because diabetes, as an example, provide, uh, create multifaceted problems, not just health problems, but also economic problems between the family. So that linked me then to, uh, to the next topic on education. COVID has created a, a whole new world. Now, in education, we, we, have, we now have to face with remote learning. It's no longer just on-campus learning. On one hand, because of the, the lesser need to travel, uh, there's a lower carbon footprint. But on the other hand, we also face challenges uh, on learning itself because when, when we attend university education, it's not just about learning the curriculum, but also the peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, the networking. So when we don't travel, we compromise on what we can learn outside what we could learn uh, in, in the classroom. The third point I want to talk about is then relationship. To sustainability and relationship, they go together, but sometimes they go in the opposite direction. Now, so in the world, in, in the COVID world that we are in right now, where we are in Zoom meeting, Microsoft Teams, and Cisco WebEx, are we losing relationships? Um, do we have... 20 years down the road, can we recall the fun times we have on campus, the late night hours studying, uh, the relationship that we create? So when we, talk, when, when we talk about the UK and Singapore sustainable future, particularly in this area of education, and we are all gathered today as alumni, uh, we, we have to also consider, well, on one hand, the remote learning does help us. But on the other hand, how do we also avoid uh, the dilutions of relationships? Uh, so with that, I come to the end of my sharing. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Steve. I guess one of the uh, really interesting to hear both your contributions, both highlighting some of the social issues you know, that, that are part of the sustainability picture and the demographic changes that you know, are, are being uh, experienced in both countries. Because of you know both your expertise, I'm tempted to invite uh, you, perhaps just uh, Alex, first to think about what contribution 
you know, some of the new technologies can play. Um, in diabetes, for example, or other chronic disease um, prevention, uh, population health, you know, what, what role does technology play? And perhaps we start off with that, and then Steve might be thinking about, you know, the leadership role that we need to play in introducing those kinds of approaches. What do you think about, I know you're an AI expert, you see, so I'm, I'm always wanting to hear what you guys have to say. Well, I, I think AI has um, is an overused, overused word, right? So I'll, I'll try to avoid that. But but I think um, having looking at the topic tonight, we have green initiatives, we have education, we have um, how do you progress forward? I think all these things has one word that ties in everything, and that word is technology, right? So technology is um, is a double-edged sword. I always believe it's a double-edged sword because when technology, you use technology on, at scale, right? And all you, if you look at it from the, the good and bad perspective, all you need is just one megalomaniac to press one button and things are irreversible. So I, I, come, from the, I come from the angle where um, for mankind, for us, right? Uh, our duty is really to make use of technology to delay the inevitable, which I believe, more pessimistic, right? But I do believe that uh, this is our duty, right? It's really up, to, really up to us to delay, to extend the time and all this, right? Coming back to uh, technology and healthcare and all this, and and it particularly, I think aging is is a particular issue, right? I think um, uh, besides uh, climate change, I think if we talk about aging and depopulation, that is actually a real threat. Right. If you look at an, an extreme example would be Japan, I think they have a population of 120 million. I think in years to come, they are, they are, the model says that they will go reduce their population to 80 million if they don't do anything now. Right. And that's uh, a prevailing, um, not just in cities, in, in places like Japan, but it's actually happening in major countries, especially European countries as well. So the question here would be, no, it's not just about technology, but, but how, do we, how are we able to... Uh, mitigate all these these dangers, right? Obviously, I think right. Um, one way would be in terms of technology. Again, going back to technology again. Um, uh, Stephen touched on the fiscal relationship, the importance of this. But on the other hand, I think um, there's there's a whole new world out there, right? Right now, I think the, the uh, again uh, the buzzword is metaverse, right? So, but if you again think about the Ready Player One, if you watch the movie, I think that world is going to be very different. Is going to be very real, right? And I also believe that that world is going to be an opportunity, right? Because uh, the fact that you, yes, I think we cherish the physical contact, the, the hugs, the hellos, the handshakes, and, but I think we also need to be able to embrace that and see this as an opportunity. How to, because we will be able to be in, say, for example, between Singapore and UK, we will be able to get there in future in an instance, right, because it's the digital rhyme, which also gives a whole bunch of opportunities because in the medical field, you will be able to do, right, uh, we're looking at VRs, mixed realities, and the operations, are, they, are, they can be done remotely. So all these are opportunities in terms of the way we transmit knowledge, right? So going back to, again, where the, the, the university can play in terms of the role, because the university itself is, is a, it's the abundance of knowledge. So how do you get that out? I think that's where um, uh, the, the real opportunity is in terms of uh, technology, in terms of how we embrace it and, and the way we look at it. Okay, thank you. I, mean, the, I guess sometimes the debate you know, around climate change and sustainability more generally is, you know, is it going to be addressed and best tackled as, as a technological issue or a technical scientific issue? But I wonder, you know, a, a competing argument, you know, from my world probably would be that it's it's as much social in the changes that we'll need to make as a, as a society. So I, I, you know, which you know, which which do you think is the thing we should be pursuing? Maybe Stephen, with his uh, many charitable involvements, you know, which where should we be looking? You know, people to change, technology to solve answers. You know, what 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 should we be looking for in the future? There's, like there's, the, a, there's no right answer. It's not a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the chicken and egg uh, type of Possibly. argument. I'm inclined to say it, it's human. It all starts with the heart. Uh, it, sustainability is not just an academic term. It affects everybody. 
it affects everybody on the street. And that's something I feel that uh, Singapore can learn from UK. The, the concept of sustainability is a lot more entrenched in UK. So again, coming back to diabetes, Singapore, we, we, we look to diabetes UK quite a lot actually for, for examples in, in advocacy here. When we, when we, if we can encourage people to embrace the concept, and sustainability is not just about recycling, it is not just about lowering food wastage, it's not just about reducing water consumption, it, it's, it's a philosophy. When we embrace it as a philosophy, as a way of life, that, that will create a ripple effect throughout throughout the community that would also encourage more people like Alex and his peers to create technology enablers to help us to even achieve more benefits uh, for the greater good of the society. So example, telemedicine is one. Thank you. No, but, but I also think that um, yeah, it, it's also about leadership because I think if we, if we are in a position of leadership and I, I'm sure, look, I mean everybody around the in the room. You are in a, a position of authority or leadership of somewhere, I mean, you're a subject matter expert of something, right? But you have to recognize that fact that you have certain amount of power, right? If you, but if you recognize that and you are able to do something about it, right? That, that is on you, right? This is very important. You have to recognize that it's going to be on you. I, I sort of recognized that uh, a couple of months back and because of my own company, I, I, I recently decided that we should actually put a sustainability statement onto the website just to say it, right? Because it's just a sim simple statement. But I think by doing that, you, you also recognise that we, we in, a, in a very small part, have a role as a global citizen, right? That, that is at a company level, right? But how do you do that at a, you know, at a, as a family level? Because I'm a father, so how do I get that? But, so to me, that's very important because I need to bring that level leg legacy to, to my, the next generation as well. Because again, you, you, you we're bringing this world, and the question here is: with what kind of what kind of world are we living for for the next generation? So, and that is a very important question that we have to ask ourselves, right? So, I, I believe that every, everyone in this room has the power to do something. So, the question here is: what are you going to do about it, and what is your response? Good. I hope they're thinking up some good questions for, uh, for, for you to answer this as well as answer for themselves. But, you know, one of the uh, immediate uh, issues about the pandemic that we both touched on a bit, you know, is this question of do we now no longer need to have the kind of relationships that exist when you're face to face, you know, or is now it sufficient to uh, live on Zoom or, or, or Teams meetings, you know, can we not save the planet by, you know, stopping to travel. And that's, you know, that's an argument. But on the other hand, I think when we look at education, you know, is that, is that, is that sufficient? You know, and I, th I think within our own community of, uh, of universities, there's a, a very lively discussion. Not uh, a single view is held, surprisingly, but that's not unusual in universities. But, you know, about whether or not we should be you know, working from home all the time, uh, staying uh, in the office all the time, or somewhere between. And for a, a university like the University of London, you know, with 190 possible places to travel to, <laughs> uh, we don't make them all every year, but, uh, you know, this is a real live debate. So, you know, this, uh, I don't, you know, you're both involved in uh, organizational and business life, you know. I'd be interested in hearing how that debate is working itself through in your own uh, experience. I have to say it's very much a lively topic where we are at the University of London. So I know, see, so you, you work in, in, the, in the management and consultancy side, Steve. What's, you know, what's this feeling like in your world? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, I, I started my career as a management consultant and the life of a management consultant involved tremendous amount of traveling. I think this is the first time ever in my life, in my adult life, that I have not traveled for two and a half years. Uh, in the past, I, I'm known to travel every, almost every week. I have clients in Hong Kong expecting me to fly up there for a meeting and, and I'll fly back. It's, I, it's literally a day trip. Uh, there, there was a project that I signed a few years ago um, and the client said, on, on a Friday evening, said, I want to see you on Monday afternoon. Uh, if I don't see you, then I'm not going to sign a contract. 
Uh, so I have to scramble and book an air ticket. Monday morning I flew up to meet the client in the afternoon and, and we set up some nitty gritty details of the contract and he signed it. At the end of the meeting, he said to me candidly, he said, I deliberately asked to meet, I deliberately tell you on a Friday evening that I want to see you on Monday afternoon because I want to gauge your level of commitment. I want to know whether you're committed and do I have your time when I want to have your time. And because I make that trip, then he signed a contract. So then I was in Mercer. Thank God, that's pre-COVID. In the last two years, I don't have client who said that. Now we are all on Zoom. Uh, we have started projects. We have ended projects. It's all on Zoom and Webex and whatnot. So life has changed in that sense. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. Lesser travel expenses, lesser business expenses. Um, we are more. We run a leaner organizations. We have. Uh, we can channel more money to charities, as an example. Lower footprint. But I do miss the relationship. Uh, that's that's the relationship really suffer. So on one hand, climate change great, lower carbon footprint. On the other hand, relationship bad. So we need to find a balance. Uh, so I'll end off by saying, absent make the heart fonder. <laughs> In the past, when I go up to Hong Kong so often, like people just don't miss me. But if I go up right now, I, I, I think I will have very treasured moments. Like how Billy and I are talking about, oh, it's great to see you again. You know, where do you want to go? We're like, I'll bring you for some local places. I didn't say that to him two years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, I, I absolutely I was smiling because uh, I had the same thing because I will do day trips literally from Hong Kong. I will do the I'll do the um there's a midnight flight. I can't remember that at the time and then I'll I'll land in Hong Kong for five, six and then we do whatever we need to do and then pff, night we're back. So it's a literally twenty four hour trip. I do get that. But but I don't miss it to be really honest with you. I mean I, I think this has um given us a more balanced life, right? And and I um, of course, there's challenges to be had, right? But on the other hand, I think there's these challenges we, we sort of need to embrace. That's the sign of times anyway, right? Um, so moving forward, I, I think it's a little bit like uh, the next generation. I think it's more of us, we, having the need to adapt to the current environment. We, we, again, we need to remember the, the Darwin, I think he said, you know, it's not the biggest or the strongest that will survive, but it's really the ones who are able to adapt. So I think we, we, are in the, we have to be in that mode, right? It is very important for us at a, as an individual, but not only at an at a individual level, but also at a... <laughs> the big challenge here would be transformation. How would, how would the university transform and to, to be able to continue to deliver education that remains relevant, right, in, in this um, Industry 4.0? Right? That, that's a big question. <laughs> Heavy responsibilities on your shoulders. Um, so I find it's really about adapting, I, I truly believe. Yes, well, it is a live issue in the, in the, uh, in the university, and I, I think most students who are used to a campus-based experience were very keen to get back to the university, um, very keen to remain in the halls, even sometimes when you know, lockdown was happening, because uh, the experience of the... Of, of life as a student is a social one as much as it's a, it's, it's a knowledge-based and an exam-based one. And I think some people would say the same about, um, about medicine. You know, it's possible to do it on uh, telemedicine. It's possible to never go through the doors of a, of, of a medical consultation. But I don't know if the population feels confident, you know, or ready for this. Certainly, uh, it's, it's, it's a discussion uh, that is very lively again at the moment. We, we only have a few minutes left, and I, I guess the final thing I'd like to get your take on, maybe something that would stimulate some thoughts in the audience, is there's, you know, the, the UN, um, you know, the international panel that announced its report earlier this week uh, was very much in the um, emergency, this is a crisis, it's now or never mode. And again, different thoughts about, is that the way to get people ready to take on board the the size of the challenge, are they going to make this, you know, many big and small changes that are necessary to, you know, in this case, to deal with the global warming problem, which, you know, they were predicting to go up to three and a half percent unless we do something quite dramatically different. That, you know, that, that was a particular approach that the, that the head of the UN took this, um, this week. Others would say, you know, if it's that big and you make it so panicky, 
it immobilizes people because they don't know what they can do about it. So there's the, again, you know, how as public, uh, you know, very much public figures in, your, in yourselves uh, and, and others in the room, you know, you know, what's our sense of the best way of engaging the public in these issues so that they don't feel either paralyzed or terrorized, um, but actually engaged and seeing their role in making the changes that we need to make the, make the planet sustainable? Again, no right answers, just interested, you know, from a Singaporean perspective, active, uh, active alumni, what do you uh, think between the tone of voice that is needed to generate these debates? Maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, I think, first of all, we, we have to recognize um, what is clear and present danger. It has to be clear, it has to be present, it has got to be a danger. Right? If we recognize that, the sort of question here, I go back to, if we recognize that as a danger, immediate danger, then the question is not about whether, it's a danger, whether is it a danger or not. The question goes back to what is your response? Right, so what is your response to that? So again, going back, again, if you recognize that and your response is to do nothing, then that's going to be on you. Right? So it, it, there's a, there, first of all, of course, you, 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 I see this from at a very personal level first. Right? We, in Singapore, there's something called, um, we, again, Singaporeans will know this. Why, why Singapore is not as, um, in terms of recycling, is, is something called a shoot the rubbish chute, because everything goes out to chute, right? We, we are not used to recycling, separating plastics to, and that's um, almost, I, I don't know whether it's universal, universal or it's but it's very Singaporean. You just, everything goes out to chute. So it's, the question here again, if you recognize this as a present danger, at a personal level, what are you doing about this? Right? It's personal ownership, right? Of course, and then you go up to the, Community level, family level, community, company, government, all these are, are, are levels where perhaps some places we can't have no control over, right? Because these are micro policies, right? But at a, at a level where, at where we, what we can do is really up to us. So I think um, not only in our, in our sphere of a personal sphere, but also in a professional sphere as well. So I, I think it's really down to ownership. And for you, what, what, what makes you feel ownership, do you think? The, the, the big panic or the you know, some little small things you can do every day? I think, I think it goes down to legacy. <laughs> right? I mean, you, if you have kids and all this, then you're sort of, again, going back to what, what kind of world are you living to, to the children, my kids, right? So I can't control what other people do, but I can control, control what I do. So I think it's really going back down to recognizing the, again, the clear and present danger. And then that's number one. Number two would be, what is your response? And what do you think, Stephen? Uh, in, in my role with the various organizations, I observe there are two driving factors right now when it comes to addressing sustainability. One is government-led, and another one is the social activist group. The social activist group is trending, and a large part of them are made up of the millennials. Uh, I'm personally very impressed with the teenagers, uh, those in their 20s, who are very, very passionate about sustainability. And because of them, their parents, their grandparents, they're all influenced by it because they're all in the same household. I have colleagues in their 50s telling me they are in recycling now because their children are scolding them for not doing so. So, so that, that's, a, that's a driving force. The second one is government-led. Uh, gov the government has acknowledged the importance of sustainability. Uh, a number of programs have been rolled out to encourage that. Uh, Alex talked about the truth. In some of the HDB that I know of now, the government has put in like monitoring system on what you can throw in, how much you can throw in. Yeah, those, those, those are the way I, so, you know, there's a saying in Singapore, we are a fine country. Have you heard of that? <laughs> we are a fine country, as in fine. You get fine, chewing gum, you get fined, right? The best way to change behavior is to find. <laughs> and everything then will be fine. <laughs> so, I foresee more fine coming in some ways to encourage certain type of behavior, especially when it comes to excessive uh, uh, waste. Uh, 
So there has been quite a number of reports coming out uh, that there's excessive waste, especially during COVID, where people work from home, uh, like Sam Corp Ways and some of these companies all complain they have to do multiple trips to HDB estate right now and rubbish to overflowing. Have you read those articles? Uh, my fellow Singaporean, but there are people complaining on the second floor, the rubbish chute went up to the second floor, you open it, you can smell. <laughs> yeah. so, at, so coming back to that, I say there are two driving factors. One is the social activist group, which I see is trending. Second, I do. I, I expect more government programs coming out that would encourage sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've we've heard from the from uh, from the panel. I think we're looking forward to some questions from uh, f from you. We've uh, given you a few things to think about. Some questions. You know, are you going to? Are you happy to work from your home forever, or do you want to go to the office again? You know, these are questions I guess that many people in organizations are thinking about. If you are studying yourself or have you know family who are in education, you know which. We have parents who are very keen on having their uh, young people back in the classroom. We've got others who don't. Uh, you know, and you yourselves, you know, how are you changing your lives? I mean, I know at the University of London, we've got a big building that you sometimes see pictures of in our various uh, stories. Senate House. It's a lovely building, grade two listed, art deco building. Uh, not built with uh, a green strategy in mind. <laughs> and we're just now having to look at re renewing the heating system, you know, and we have choices between a very, very expensive ecological one or a much cheaper gas one. And, um, you know, this debate will be had. So it's, uh, it's, I think many of us in our day-to-day -day lives are facing these questions and the, the pragmatic short-term versus the long-term, you know, where, where are we motivated to pitch things at the moment? Anyway, those are the sort of questions that we'd be interested in, or comments even from the floor. So over to you, Bill, and your new gadgetry well, my, of uh, my, Slido. I, I've got a pen, I've got a piece of paper, I've got a mobile phone. I hadn't charged my iPad, so the technology was a fail, but that was, a, that was the, the leadership fail on my part. Um, the, the questions came piling in towards the end, which was very exciting, I think. Um, I'm trying to group them into some categories for you. There's clearly, um, there's a few solid categories. I mean, there is a lot of questions about education. And there's two or three which um, I'd, I'll try and bunch together. It's interesting what you said about Senate House, our headquarters building where a lot of learning goes on, but also a, a lot of archiving and storage of our library. So um, there's a question about um, learning. Do you see a fundamental shift in the learning environment due to COVID? Because virtual learning is being successfully executed at an unprecedented scale. And actually, um, Adam Coe, follow-up question of that, more on the sort of the... Uh, the knowledge side, on a sustainable side, um, how is this possible uh, uh, from an archival system? Um, ancient civilizations have done this via war writings. We've got quite a lot of uh, stuff in our amazing library. How do we share that with the world? How do we make that more sustainable? Um, and then there was um, a sort of a follow-up question about what, what can universities do to support these things? So uh, two or three questions there to do with education and what we as a university and maybe what we can do with Singapore as well. Maybe I'll kick off, I guess, and then you can you can uh, you can then tell me how I've got it wrong, <laughs> as you're the, as you're the experts. Vice chancellors are used to that, so I'll 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 take that position. The um, I think actually just uh, uh, the day I was leaving uh, London for this trip, I was shown, been shown a, a, this super duper scanning system within in our Senate House Library. Um, we actually own some of the final. Um, essays and, and archives from Nelson Mandela. And we have now, in fact, I was being shown it to see if we could buy it, you know, so the, I was being titillated where can we have this, you know, uh, latest toy. It was being, you know, showing that not only can we just simply scan and send documents to people where they can use them for their own research, but actually it can be done live, you know, scaled up and down. There's somebody teaching it what it, in, a, in Senate House while it's being communicated um, digitally, really, to classroom anywhere. It could be here, in, in, uh, it could be anywhere in the world. Now, that kind of dynamic live teaching experience, to me, is valuable. People aren't going to all come to Senate House and go through our Shakespeare you know, folios or whatever collections or Dickens originals, uh, whereas now we can actually show them in a, and the detail and precision with which these machines can show things and distribute them are quite amazing. Now, from my point of view, as the holder of uh, this archive, which 
is, you know, doesn't come at a small price. <laughs> um, being able to distribute it in that sort of valuable way is, it just makes it so much more impactful. Uh, and it also means people aren't traveling around the world just to see a particular document uh, f you know, for what might not take a great deal of time. So I, I, th I see it as an exciting possibility. Uh, and the teaching environments, I think if you were to go, in, I'm sure it's here, the case in Singapore as well, if you visit classrooms uh, th through the COVID and post-COVID period, they are completely different. Uh, they are, it's not just some some poor you know person in a room with a zoom machine and uh, in their bedroom and hoping they you know they've they've kind of understood the lecture anyway so i think it's exciting uh, and i guess the combination obviously is you know is, is how well for university you know as i was being shown this kit how are we going to invest in this you know from from a whole new infrastructure uh and you know what is the you know the, the relationship element retained while we're still doing this but you both have uh, different experience. Of, you know, you're, you do AI, Alex. I don't know if you've got some uh, thoughts about education and how we could be making use of these opportunities and saving the planet at the same time. I guess that's the trick. Yeah, I, I, when, when you say you're, uh, you're trying to... We, we go back to archival system, and that, that sort of excites me because um, that's really have to do with knowledge, right? I, I did mention before, I mean, uh, knowledge actually is locked by two elements, right? Fun, one is where the knowledge is. Because if the knowledge is locked in within the archives, then literally the only way to access that is to walk to the archives in a physical form to get to the librarian and, and to, to, to get to that. So it's a physical thing. That is, so digitizing it is fundamentally the first level. So, so I, will, I will say I, 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 congratulations. I'm excited about it. To be really honest with you, I'm excited about it. Right, I, I will challenge you as the leadership, right, um, to the next element, which is knowledge is also locked by its own language, right? Because if uh, whatever knowledge is said in the English, if you, if I'm from, um, um, I don't understand English, right? How will I be able to access it? So the question here would be, you know, this is where I think technology can really help where you can actually uh, release, I would say, um, exponentially um, to be able to find things that are not in your language. Right? So this is one of those things I, I say, I, I say this passionately because this is something that we, that we, that's our work, right? Because the ability to find things in another language, that's the content loop. To us, is that really it will be the content loop and that you cannot be able to achieve that uh, without technology and without AI at this present time. Of course, um, getting to the knowledge and to be able to find it, and then you, you, will, you will say that, of course, you know, the, the difference between content and context, right, is, is very much the difference between uh, translation and interpretation, right? So that's another level altogether. We're not there yet with <laughs> interpretation, right? But I think we are close to be able to locking, unlocking uh, knowledge uh, within the, all these archives, but of course the first thing that needs to be done would, would be to digitize it first. So congratulations, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thank you. What, do you. what do you think, Stephen, about these things? I think the key to the sustainable future is education and is important to make it as inclusive as possible. I like what Alex said about it transcending language. Uh, that's even in in the world outside education, like in finance that I'm from, uh, the, the hot topic right now in Singapore, Hong Kong is digital banking. And one of the key criteria for issuing the license has been on financial inclusion. So inclusion is synonymous with sustainability. And I think the key to achieving sustainability is to promote a broader education uh, to get people to embrace it as much as possible uh, in, in different cultures and different languages. Yes, yeah, so, um, we had a, s a session on the digital humanities recently uh, at Senate House, and there was, because this is, um, again, it was a new field for me, it, it, is that the whole way that, um, you know, searching and research is done is now through, you know, algorithms, uh, not the old style index cards or even not even library searches, you know, uh, and the whole way that you, 
now need to understand whether the search engine is driving you to the thing you really wanted or whether it's driving you to something it wants you to look for. Uh, this has become in itself, you know, part of the whole fake news debate and we have people uh, in our school advanced study who are experts in this sort of thing. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's a very new field and I sometimes think the universities perhaps are a little bit behind the, some of the, you know, more leading edge industries. Um, well, I mean, for education, uh, it's, it's always lagging, right? So it's, it's, it's like saying right now, we, the, the jobs that we have 10 years later don't even exist now. So how are you going to educate the, the next generation for a job that does not exist now? So that's always, right? there's always the challenge in, in terms of education, right? And, and like I said, I, I, I was on a, in a conversation with, uh, with a chief cybersecurity officer in a, one of the, the banks, and, and he said, I mean, whatever we, we learn today, three years later, irrelevant. Totally irrelevant, right? So, okay, so, so, so what are we doing now? I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of a panic mode because my timeline was a little bit longer than his, right? So he said three years. So which means that we actually have to keep on learning. But again, that comes back where the opportunity is. Uh, again, one of the challenges, the common problems that we have between UK and Singapore, right? So this is a continuous learning. How do you make sure that you make yourself relevant right, in, with, with the industry and of course uh, with humanity as well? Okay, Bill. Questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the debate. Um, I'm going to throw a slight, not curveball at you, but it's a, it, you know, it, this is a topic you'll never get to the, uh, the bottom of. But there's, there's a few questions coming in about, um, so Stephen talked in his opening address about health, but mental health sustainability. Yeah, we're human beings. It's all very well talking about technology and things like that. But in terms of humanity, how, how can education help support the mental health of students and people generally? But also in, in the wider healthcare, um, in terms of finance and manpower, how are we able to deal with the problems we faced in the past couple of years as a result of COVID? And are we really asking ourselves what, what truly matters? Um, so those, I'll try to get two or three questions in. Apologies if I've paraphrased those wrong to the, to the people asking the questions. Good luck with that. That's for me. All right, okay. So you mentioned about mental health and manpower, the two impact, yeah. Uh, I'm, I've been advocating mental health changes since last year uh, and working with various people uh, in the government, uh, uh, in social activist group. The mental health has been a huge challenge because of COVID. I, I don't think it's just a Singapore thing, it's, it's UK and many countries. The, uh, and mental health, some people say it's as important as physical health. And many times we focus too much on physical health that we neglect our mental health. Sustainability is about survivability. I mentioned that in my opening remarks. So I, I completely agree that mental health is something that we all need to focus on. And it shouldn't just, specifically in Singapore context, it shouldn't just be a government responsibility. A large part of it, I believe, rests with the employer. And a number of people are now advocating for employers to do more to, to like mental health workplace uh, wellness, a workplace mental wellness program. And that relates then next to your question on manpower. COVID also means that we all work from home, which means we have very limited interaction with our colleagues, our supervisors. Some people love it. Those people who prefer to work independently, some people hate it. You know, they feel like they need to be away from home. Uh, they feel like they're not getting enough guidance from their supervisor. In short, I would say we are entering a new norm. And a lot of things that we were used to in the past are not going to come back. I, I look forward to that with, with mixed feelings. In some ways it's great, in some ways it's bad. Um, I just pray that you will be good for us at the end of the day. Mental health is, I think fundamentally, we, we humans are, are social animals, right? We, we are very social. And we, we live in a family, we live in a community, we live in different workplace and, and all this. I think we, on the other hand, right, um, going back to um, the newer generation, right, I, I think there's a lot of things that we can also learn. Um, I, I think the newer generation has a lot more, a lot more work about oh, mental health issues and all this where, where I think we, we, 
especially I think in, I was I was almost say t- towards the Asian and and the male culture and then mental health issues are are difficult to it, it's difficult to to talk about right um, actually last two years we we have actually sponsored um, uh, a group right that advocates mental health right uh, it's not something that we typically again as a company think about to be really honest with you because we, we think about bottom line and how do we make things better and all this but we sort of realize that hey by the way you know that it's something that we need to think about we, I think we try I think companies are still trying to figure out how can we do this right um, I, I admittedly I think we were not sure I, I must say myself even for myself because um, with this COVID right I haven't been to my care office for two years we, we see them, I see them very often, almost every day on Zoom. But how are they really? I'm really not too sure. Right? So I'm really looking forward to going back, to going to see them and, and just to have dinner with them and see how things, everything is going. And it's not talking about business, right? It's talking about really about the connections. But on the other hand, I think we, we, there's no going back. I absolutely agree. There's no going back. Again, it gives us opportunities right, where we are able to touch base a lot more often Right, rather than going physically there, and 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 I used to do this actually. I used to when there's a problem, I would literally drop everything and drive into KL and be there in four hours. Happened before, it shocked my guys, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> can you imagine? They say, "Oh, we have a problem," but they never think that you'll actually be there. But it's, you can't do this now. So how the question here is, how are we able to adapt to these times? I think again, going back to. The, 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 our ability to adapt to this current situation is something that uh, we just have something we have to live with. Thank you. Um, I guess this leads on, and I, I, you know, we've got time for, for one or two more. Um, but there's a couple of things coming out about, and I, I love someone put a, it was anonymous, I think, but putting the um, the phrase, "How do we, um, if we're going to be sustainable, uh, look after the obsolete current, i.e., short term?" Um, putting food on the table, things like that, um, especially in, in the post-COVID world and energy crises and things like this, with actually investing in the future when there isn't a lot of spare resource to go around. Is that leadership? Is that government? Is it the ownership, the personal responsibility? Is it a combination of all of those? Um, how, how are we going to deal with this? I'll take a step at this. I think um, if, if you're not able to put food on the table, then there's nothing to talk about. It's, it's clear, right? Because we, we need to be <laughs> the, the hierarchy of needs, right? So we need to be able to put food on the table. We need to be able to do that. And, and then we perhaps we can do uh, talk about uh, sustainability and all these things. So, so right, then we, we talk about the subject of poverty. And that's big, right? Because if you, if you are, if you are at, the, at that level, there's nothing that they want to talk about. What leadership what are you talking about? That, that, wouldn't, that conversation would not be relevant. So again, question here would be going back to how education can be a very absolute leveler, right? To be able to be more inclusive, to be able to get that, get them out. And, and education has done that through hundreds of years, right? So really, is, it a, is education, again, going back to our go back to the archives with knowledge and if we are able to get that knowledge out and in some form and to enrich that level and to bring that up, right, then, then that's our job. Again, is is because we are, again, I, I did say that we are in a leadership role, right? So what are we doing that? Because lead, poverty is real. Whether, whether is it in UK or whether it's in Singapore or whether it's in any country, right? So again, without that conversation coming up, we, it's very difficult to talk about sustainability. I'm, I'm not too sure I'm going, going off topic, but I think it's, it's something that's truly relevant. And it's back on the agenda. It's, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, it may be different here, but this cost of living is a topical issue the way it hasn't been for years. Um, and fuel, the cost of fuel, to heat homes, uh, you don't need to worry about heating homes. But I think uh, the air conditioning uh, must be a, must be a, a pretty uh, energy-consuming uh, feature of, of life here. But certainly in, in the UK, the cost of living now is one of the biggest political issues, and uh, and this question of what role the government should have 
in um, protecting people from those kind of vagaries of, of cyclical change in, in economic conditions or, uh, you know, is this something people personally should be managing themselves? But it is, it is difficult, I think, to, to put the sustainability is issues alongside people who can't afford to, to eat their homes. I guess in an ideal world, these two things could come together because, you know, the cost of, of uh, in our case, heating, you know, will, and oil and gas will perhaps drive through some of the more sustainable for sources of, uh, of energy that would have perhaps not been thought of before. And, and they've done some research. I mean, a place I worked for recently, it, it worked in recently in East Anglia, is very good for creating wind. Uh, it's got a lot of flat land, puts out, uh, it's got the largest wind farm in, 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 in uh, possibly in the world, in the North Sea. Now, if you let people have a discount on their energy who live around the wind farm, they'll, they'll be happy to have the wind farm. If, um, if the wind farm energy goes into a, into a cable and goes down to London, not so happy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these sort of trade-offs, sometimes there is a happy win-win um, situation if you, you know, if you approach it with, uh, with, with those sort of the social as well as the sort of technological views in mind. Um, Anyway, that was me on East Anglia. It's not really directly relevant, but I think London will face some of the same questions about how we're actually going to fuel uh, and, and manage to wean ourselves off oil and gas. Are there any other questions? That um, the, the, there's, there's lots, actually, um, and we're not going to be able to get Got to them all. 53 seconds. Um, I was going to, yeah, I, it's 50 <laughs> seconds, um, and I know I, I don't want to be the person between you and your food. Maybe, no, just not. as a nice way to wrap up. I mean, the, the last question that came in, I thought was very, very um, interesting. Is it, what tips can you give to students? Not that I, it's not, I'm going to wrap this into a different way. What tips can you give to students who have spent the last two years studying from home, missing out on the interactions? What, what can you do? Maybe, maybe you can answer that, but also, is there one thing each of the three of you have done in the past two years to um, get out of the, just the working from home bubble? I mean, for me, I was here in January, I'm here today. I mean, I, this is part of my job. I love being out and meeting our alumni you can only do so much over a Zoom screen. So the opening up that we're seeing in Singapore and in the UK is very helpful. Is there something each of the three of you have learned over the past two years that what things you really miss and, and any tips? Maybe I'll start with Stephen and Alex and then I'll take the mm. final word because mm. that's my problem. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. I said earlier, absence made the heart fonder. <laughs> I, I realized that, um, yes, the, the limited face-to-face -face interactions make every meeting more meaningful than before. That's something that I've learned uh, over the last two years. Give me a different perspective now when I have the chance to meet up with family and friends. And when I get to travel again to meet my friends in other countries, I think I will really treasure those moments compared to in the past when I'd, ah, just another Hong Kong trip. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I think... Um, I really appreciate the me time. I really appreciate the me time because I, I was able to go back to uh, uh, my likes, I mean, my hobbies, and, and to be able to do that. Because if you're traveling and all this, you just can't, right? Um, and if, if we talk about any advice um, to any students or whoever, I, I think the me time and the, the self awareness is very important. And, and, and within these two years, I also did a couple of courses, which I never thought that I would do physically. Right, I, I did one on um, history of Christianity. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm more interest, interested on the on the history part rather than the Christianity part. But the point here is that it was a free course, I think, on, on MIT from MIT. So again, coming from uh, an education, it's, it was free, right? So why not, right? And and if you want a certificate out of it, then you pay. But I don't need it because it's more for for myself. So I think is is important while we are looking into, again, busy lifestyles and all this, I truly appreciate. Um, and this time, I was able to, to go back and find myself. So I think, again, it's really about adapting to the times. Um, so I, I, I actually don't mind. Look, um, we have gone full virtual, right, in our work and all this, and again, we're still adapting. Um, but I think we are, again, we're trying to discover the new us in order to move forward to be able to make ourselves relevant, relevant again right, during this time. 
Great. Well, I, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll be quick and just say one of the things we've really appreciated is the importance that students place on each other and the social aspect of education. Um, you know, they come away with a University of London degree or from one of our many institutions. It, it serves them well in all, in all cases. But the three years they spend together, they're going to remember those times. I mean, I've tried to tell them, they'll remember the times they were locked together in their halls, probably having uh, up to all sorts of things, that those will be the, the legends which they will tell to their children, probably. But, but so what, what it's made us think about it is, though, is how to make Senate House more student-friendly. And we're going to be introducing, even as early as this summer, some what we're calling massive small changes. I think it has a sort of Confucian sort of sound to it, doesn't it? Anyway, that wasn't our intention. But lots of little things around the building to invite students in, give them places to sit, um, you know, and uh, encourage them to make use of the grounds. And, and you know, we, we face um, the British Museum. It's a lovely spot, Russell Square on one side, Bedfordshire on the other. So um, so that I think it's, it's realizing how much value students place on it that has led us to do this with some sense of urgency. So that's my, that's my small Thank contribution. You. Thank you very much. And I will respond to the person who said, in terms of this being a sustainability event, why have you printed brochures? So I will, I will own that, and we will look into that for the future. Um, thank you very much for that question. I'll hold my hands up to that one. And there was someone who asked, um, what, what uh, initiatives have the UK and Singapore uh, got that are working together for this? Um, I think you'll get an answer to that in the keynote speech after dinner. I will not stand between you and your food and drink any further. Can you please show your appreciation to the panel? Thank you very much. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Um, for those of you still enjoying your dessert, I hope it was as good as the first couple of courses. Um, there's no beef left in the house because I ate it all. Um, so we're going to carry on. I know a couple of you are still eating your desserts, but we'll carry on because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, you must be enjoying the evening so much. Um, so thank you very much for the first part of the evening. Uh, so it was just very enjoyable hearing the questions and seeing the questions coming in. I, I do apologize for not being able to answer all of them. Maybe during the, uh, the keynote address, some of them will get answered later. But um, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Joel Teo, who's the president of the University of London Alumni Group. There's quite a few members of the executive committee here who I've known for a number of years. Um, they have been so supportive of our 60,000 alumni here in Singapore. And if any of you would like to get involved in future events, please come and see me or Holly or Joel, but we'd really appreciate your support going forward um, for sustainability. Um, so thank you very much. Without further ado, Joel, would you like to come and say a few words? Thank you. Okay, I'll try to keep it short. Um, thanks everyone for coming. So a bit of history. On 28th of January, 1819, Raffles landed in Singapore, right? And he bet with the Temenggong. And then he landed at the Singapore River, where you see it uh, with his landing spot behind Parliament House in Singapore. And then on the 1st of December, 1887, the Saki's brothers opened this hotel, right? And it was named after Stanford Raffles and known as the Raffles Hotel. And then in August 1902, something interesting, um, the last tiger in Singapore was hunted at the bar downstairs. Okay, yeah. In more recent history, on the 9th of August 2011, on National Day, um, our society was uh, gazetted um, by Singapore Parliament right into being. And then we started running our society events in Singapore. I think some of you have uh, seen us over the years. We have been growing and everything. So tonight, we want to um, tell everyone that it's opportune that, you know, uh, in such a historical location, such as Raffles Hotel, together with the University of London and all our uh, friends there, um, you know, it's really good to uh, look at the topic, creating a sustainable future. So since 2011, we have been 
actively organizing networking, job and social events to foster stronger relations between all the University of London alumni in Singapore. So today we decided that uh, we would, you know, it would be a good time to announce to everyone that we are going to launch this new University of London Alumni Singapore Business Directory for all the University of London alumni in Singapore. So um, the three things that you can take back from this would be firstly, right, for business owners and partners and alumni who are providing uh, goods and services or, you know, the business directory will help everyone increase your business visibility to other UOL alumni in Singapore. For new graduates, we are going to have a portion in the directory where you know existing alumni can indicate whether they are able to guide you know recent graduates to the hiring managers of their respective organizations. You know, or some people may volunteer to give career guidance to new graduates, right? And then for thirdly, for other UOL alumni that want to support the uh, other UOL businesses, some of them would be able to, you know, uh, you can, you know, go and look at the directory and see, um, you know, who are the, which other alumni you want to patronize or help to boost their marketing, right? So we look forward to all alumni to be listed in this directory, and we hope that you can create a sustainable future in Singapore by number one. Uh, scanning our QR code, you can see the code over here, right? And sign up for our live membership bundle together with the business directory. Secondly, uh, if you want, you can be a sponsor in our inaugural business directory. And thirdly, we are always looking for new volunteers for society. So if any of you wants to, you know, help us uh, organize more events for fellow UOL alumni, we'll be most pleased to do so. Okay, thank you everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to work with these guys for seven years. Um, we have alumni groups around the world, but this one is, is by far, it has the hardest job because it's got the biggest uh, amount of alumni to deal with. Um, in the past two years, I think we've all found it very hard not to be able to do events, so please give them your support. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce in a moment uh, Sam Myers, who will deliver your keynote address. Um, Sam's been diligently, or he's still diligently scribbling, uh, trying to get some answers to some of the questions. Um, Sam is Her Majesty's Deputy Trade Commissioner, he joined the UK's Department for International Trade in April 2019, where he is responsible for the trade and investment relationship between Southeast Asia and the UK. He's based here in Singapore and leads a team of 90 staff across the Asian, working, Asian region, working in British embassies and high commissions to support UK business. Before joining DIT, Sam worked for the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca, where he was head of UK science policy and relations. He also spent six years in Asia with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, boosting science and technology partnerships with Southeast Asia and China. Now, unfortunately, Sam has a master's in biochemistry from the University of Bath. But in chatting with him earlier, he said, but I did do a summer school at the London School of Economics. So he's an honorary member of the UL family, and we're very pleased to have him tonight. Sam, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, very proud uh, to have uh, got a summer school qualification from Peking University and London School of Economics. Uh, and, and I'm boastful to say that I got an A+, because uh, I just dug out my transcript whilst I was sat in the audience today. Um, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, today and uh, what a wonderful moment in a, in a fantastic uh, historic location uh, that we can come together and have an in-person event where we can engage uh, without uh, the barrier of technology in front of us. Um, so it has been a real pleasure uh, to be engaging with a wonderful group on my table um, and, and the energy in the room has been really uplifting for me. I'll try my best not to subdue that energy uh, by going on too long tonight. Uh, and Bill, you said I was, I was sort of scribbling. I was doing a combination of crossing out bits that I don't need to say, uh, most of which were covered by the excellent panel session that we had earlier. So I, I just wanted to say a few words um, about the UK and Singapore collaboration uh, on a sustainable future. It's a really exciting and important subject uh, for me. I normally wear a trade commissioner hat uh, in, in the British High Commission, um, but the importance of sustainability transcends all parts of our lives uh, and our work in this day and age. 
So I, I picked up uh, on the enthusiasm that came out of the panel discussion earlier. I really enjoyed some of the concepts that we were hearing uh, about self-sustainability and uh, the, the role that we can play, as well as a real broad coverage of education um, and, and uh, the health sides of sustainability. So I, I think the, the, the speakers that we had on that, Alex and Stephen, um, bring together sort of knowledge and technology um, as some of their specialisms. And uh, they are two of the five pillars um, of the UK-Singapore partnership of the future. Um, and that was an agreement re-energised by uh, the Singapore and UK foreign minister last year. It's a really deep historic relationship that the UK enjoys with Singapore. Um, and the pillars on which the relationship is based uh, include an optimistic, outward-looking view of the world. It is a perspective that does not shy away from uh, some of the complex issues that we've uh, faced today, and, and obviously there's still more to unpack there. Um, but it does use creativity, innovation, and trust in partnerships such as ours uh, to look at those challenges and see opportunities within. So tonight's topic of sustainability uh, is, is a really important element of that dynamic. If you'll allow me to just very briefly talk about the broader context. So I think when we talk about sustainability, um, a number of things come to mind that we've uh, already uh, covered today, social inclusion, uh, poverty eradication, supply chains. But I do think the thread that runs through them uh, is that of climate. A sustainable future cannot exist without a stable climate. Now, to share a, a few stats with you, the UN says that a 1% increase in climate risk exposure causes a widening of the Gini coefficient by nearly a quarter. That obviously increases infant mortality, uh, lowers education rates uh, by similar ranges. The Asian Development Bank, closer to home, says that unmitigated climate change in this region We'll see sea levels rise by 70 centimetres uh, in coastal and tidal regions, and it will knock 6.5% off GDP. So there's many, many reasons why we need to tackle this key challenge. And I do come, it's a serious topic. Um, we've had a lovely evening, um, and hopefully uh, I, I can help end that evening by sharing a, a note of optimism because there are serious signs now that we have reached a tipping point on the action that's needed to tackle climate change. Uh, the Vice Chancellor was referencing the COP26 summit in Scotland, um, and, and I'm really proud of the progress that all 195 countries uh, made through the Glasgow Climate Pact. In 2020, when the UK took on the presidency, uh, this was a region that we sit in now of high coal intensity, uh, and that was economic growth being fueled by high energy use uh, and a very carbon intensive uh, approach to, um, to growth. There was not a single commitment to get to net zero in Southeast Asia. If you fast forward to December with um, Scottish Exhibition Centre on uh, the Clyde River that hopefully some of you are familiar with, uh, we saw 75% of Southeast Asia's GDP covered by such net zero commitments. And that means 83% of the region's emissions should be stopped by the middle of the century. There are also commitments to end coal use uh, for the first time and discussions in the text uh, to, to, to ban coal um, by some of the biggest emitters. So we're seeing that again and again, and I believe that we are now within, uh, we've look, got a lot more to do, um, but if we've, we've got some um, independent climate action tracker modeling that shows if the commitments that were made uh, at the conference are all implemented fully, and I know that's a big if, um, but temperatures will peak at levels of 1.8 Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and those of you in the audience that know the, the climate agreement, we're aiming for 1.5 um, as, as, the, as the peak, but if we get to 1.8, to that's still within, uh, within spitting distance, and I believe we can go further. Now, that optimism shouldn't be uh, construed as complacency. Uh, the COP26 president, I think, summed it up really well um, in, in the concluding comments where there was a lot of emotion, uh, and you could see that it was a physically exhausting uh, conference for everybody. Um, I thought he said very presciently that 1.5 Celsius is alive, but its pulse is weak. 
That's because to actually implement those uh, commitments uh, was going to take a ho whole lot more effort. Um, and we've got a good long-term ambition, but at the moment, the short-term actions don't match up to the long-term action. So a long way to go. Um, but for countries in this region, uh, which has six of the world's top 25 large economies at risk of climate, um, already suffering uh, severe weather-related disasters, it's quite a worrying picture that we need to address collectively. And that's why the UK and Singapore are working together on this agenda. And the UK is carrying on uh, the presidency for the rest of this year, have a number of uh, commitments, going to continue pushing hard for a number of major emitters, some of them here in Southeast Asia, uh, to come forward with new commitments uh, by the end of the year. There's an important role for developed countries to support developing countries uh, to fulfill their um, uh, requirements. Um, and therefore, there's a promise to reach 100 billion US dollars uh, to, to support the just transition in developing countries. And to fulfill these bold equip, uh, commitments by 141 countries representing over 90% of the world's forest, um, there was some really strong action on biodiversity and forests uh, that complements the, the discussion I've just been having on climate. So the action will continue, um, but I think the second point, uh, and, and I only have three points, so we're, we're on to the home straight. Um, I just want to bring in that sense. Um, I think, you know, Alex and Stephen brought it out really well earlier. Um, and that is the opportunity that comes from transitioning to a green economy. Uh, the transition is inevitable. It has to happen. Uh, but we don't need to see that as a bad thing. And so uh, the improved air quality, stable relationship with nature, uh, and also more growth and more jobs uh, go hand in hand uh, with decarbonisation. The UK has some really strong stats to share on that front. Uh, the economy has grown over 50% uh, since 1990. Uh, and Sorry, the economy has grown over 70%, and we've cut our emissions by 50%. So that decoupling of uh, growth and uh, carbonisation uh, is, is demonstrated uh, in real time. G7 and G20 partners are also seizing these opportunities. Um, and, and there's some, you know, th there's additional reasons why moving to a more sustainable future is in the benefits of everybody. Um, over three times the number of jobs come from renewables and energy efficiency as come from fossil fuels. And 32% of employees in the renewable sector are female compared to 22% in the fossil fuel sector. So lots and lots of reasons that I think amplify each other and mean that this, this road we, we need to embark on uh, is one that will serve us well. The private sector agrees, which I'm very familiar with through my daily interactions with businesses and companies around this part of the world and in the UK. This time last year, only 20% of uh, the UK's FTSE 100 companies had committed to decarbonise by 2050. And now that figures over 70%. So we are seeing change in front of our eyes. It is happening really quickly. Uh, we don't have long for that to, to sort of come into action. Um, but, but I do believe that there's an optimistic story here. Solar PV is now cheaper than uh, coal. Uh, the latest energy auctions in this part of the world show that uh, solar costs two cents a kilowatt, whereas coal costs nine cents per kilowatt from your average coal plant. And we've got some real strong commitments from the... Um, from the uh, financial services sector. So um, companies worth 130 trillion uh, in terms of their assets under management have also committed to net zero by 2050. I do need to mention the unprovoked Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, which has uh, impacted uh, fossil fuel prices as well as uh, the, the, the devastating impact that's had on Ukraine. Um, but these make the choices even starker, that we have to transition away uh, from a dependence on fossil fuels. So let me go into the home straight, the last point. What about Singapore? I'm here to talk about the UK-Singapore partnership. Um, well, Singapore has a really unique and important role to play regionally. As many of us that, that live here know uh, the importance uh, of this uh, very, uh, very great economy in, in a really important part of the world. So Singapore's emissions are 0.1% of the global total. Uh, and this population of 5 million that, that live on this very small island, uh, which is about 0.3% the size of the UK, um, live, live in a very concentrated uh, region. Um, but the choices that politicians and, and uh, the government is taking here do have ripple effects around the region. 
So Singapore is committed to uh, the Green Plan involving five ministries coming together with substantial amounts of investment to continue Singapore's uh, journey on decarbonisation. It's taken its role as a financial hub seriously and amplifying a lot of the green investment uh, that's needed to, to fuel the transition. There's a carbon tax that Singapore has implemented, um, and it's ratcheting, ratch, ratch, ratcheting up over time uh, to increase the bite that that has and the impact that it has. Um, I think it was, uh, it, it was um, the, the panel earlier spoke about uh, fine, Singapore is a fine country. Um, well, well there, is sort of, there is action being taken uh, to make sure that we're all nudged in the right direction and that we recognize the impact that carbon has on the world. I could go on, but you'll be pleased. I'm, I'm flicking onto the last page, so I can just sort of share, the, share my summing up. I hope I've been able to have some sobering statistics, um, but also share with you why um, the world has the opportunity to implement uh, the commitments that have been made at COP26. There's a really strong uh, opportunity for Singapore to deepen the collaboration. I think events like this bring together different uh, sort of expertise, skill sets, and the importance of education in underpinning uh, that partnership, I think, is on display here today. So um, these will be sort of important tools for making sure that uh, we, can, we can meet the challenge that's in front of us. And over recent weeks, we've seen some big challenges in the region as the government's begun to reopen. I don't know if, like me, you feel slightly awkward trying to work out what the rules are, but also delighted at how great it is uh, to see each other face to face and live in this post-pandemic world. So we have bunkered down. I think we've had a really, many of us, all of us have had a really tough time, uh, but we have come together during the last couple of years to tackle the pandemic crisis. Uh, and now's the time for us to focus that effort and energy uh, on the sustainability agenda, the opportunity and the challenges uh, and solving those challenges together. So this partnership for the future um, is forward thinking. Uh, it recognizes the global challenge and doesn't shy away from them. Uh, and Many of you will know that this is Year of the Tiger. Um, so this is a year for that braveness and strength to come through. Uh, we've shown it with the pandemic. Now let's show it uh, with sustainability and climate change. And I do have every confidence that for a sustainable future, we are ready, fit for seizing that opportunity uh, and creating a greener, healthier, safer, and more prosperous year, decade, and for generations to come. So thank you very much. Have a lovely uh, rest of the evening. And thank you for letting me interrupt your dessert. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and uh, in the traditions of, uh, that I'm learning to acquire in this neighborhood, <laughs> I'd like to thank you. And of course, thanks only happen with a picture, so Excellent. you have to, so you have to you do both. Much. Center of the stage, right? It was great to hear from you today, it really brought together a lot of the issues that um, are so important and so key to this evening's discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It just leaves me to thank you all for coming this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it feels like perhaps this might have been one of your first outings uh, after the changes in regulations. So that may make it particularly special. Uh, certainly, it's been a delight for me to uh, be able to meet many of you this evening and to experience this fantastic building. And we see education and the University of London very much as part of this partnership. You know, very much of the a contribution that, uh, that London and the UK generally wishes to bring to the world and to this region in particular. So thank you all very much. And I think you will see us again. <laughs> thank you.